Okrima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is veteran journalist and best-selling author Nehama Prodi to discuss her book titled Domestic Terror, Intimate Partner Violence in South Africa. So this book explores decades of brutal domestic violence and coercive control. And you also examine women's changing rights and current legal protections. You also tell us in the book that you almost didn't finish this book. Why is this? And please tell us about your first prize. You won a competition in 1988 from the Stan newspaper when you wrote a poem about the tragedy of child abuse. Right. So uh, you've combined sort of two questions about quite a lot of different things about the book. I will try and do my best to answer. Um, I'm not really sure how they connect to each other. Um, I've been writing for a very long time. I started writing when I was a kid. And uh, at the start of this book, I mentioned how the very first time I earned money for writing was a prize that I won writing a poem for the Star newspaper, um, which I still have the check for. It was for the amount of five rand. So people who work as journalists for a living will know that the per word rate hasn't really increased much since then. Um, this was in the 1980s. And the poem was about child abuse. And the reason why I mentioned this in my book about domestic violence, which is really about the murder of adult women, primarily by their adult male partners, um, is to try and explain to the reader that we understand violence relative to ourselves, I suppose, so that when I was a child, um, the earliest understanding I had of violence wasn't necessarily violence between men and women, because even though my parents used to fight, I didn't necessarily see acts of violence acted out like that in my own home but I understood that children could be victims of violence. And this was the initial way that I started to understand how violence existed as a wrong thing, as a bad thing in the world, um, was to understand children as victims. And this really applied to learning how to understand South Africa's political landscape at the time. Um, when I was still in primary school, my parents, I was very fortunate to have a family that was quite politically active and my parents shared literature with me that allowed me to read about um, the murder of Hector Peterson, for example. And I think that was really the first time that, and I explained this in the book as well, where I was able to start to engage with what was happening under apartheid because even, you know, in uh, what was then what standard four, standard five, maybe um, it was very clear that, anybody who murdered a child um, by shooting them in the back was certainly not in the right. And so where I move on from there is to try and explain how how me growing up as, an, you know, becoming a, a young adult gradually started to learn about what, even then we were starting to call domestic violence, but we didn't always have the words for it. So a large part of the, uh, start of the book is really spent trying to explain to readers that the words that we take for granted now that we we think are very common now are actually quite recent and even though acts of violence against women have always existed um, our mothers and our grandmothers would not have had the same words for it they wouldn't have had the same laws um, and they wouldn't have had the same words so the fact that it's sometimes invisible in our own homes, it might be invisible in the books that we would have read or in the films, you know, what would have been called different words doesn't mean that it wasn't there. It just meant that it was less visible. And what this book does or tries to do is look at a, a selected number of stories of cases of domestic violence. What we would Domestic violence itself is quite a challenging term because it could just mean violence in the home. And I'm not focusing on all violence in the home. There are many types of violence that occur within domestic spaces, spaces that we live in, that we share with many other people, not only intimate partners. But this book very particularly focuses on the violence that male intimate partners meet out against their female intimate partners in the home, outside the home, after a relationship has ended. So in many different circumstances. 
And and I really do that by trying to take a look over more than 100 years worth of news articles um, and many, many cases that even though they have different language, they have a lot in common in terms of the violence itself. You also share uh, that more awareness uh, of domestic violence was also brought about by the women's centered magazine as you were also exposed to the subject while working uh, for Marie Claire. Tell us about that. Right. So um, I've worked as a journalist for nearly 30 years. Um, my earliest jobs as a journalist were working in women's magazines. And I think that uh, I mentioned in the same introduction in the first few pages of the book, really, um, very close to the same stories that I, I mentioned about starting off as a writer. Um, I talk about how it, women's magazines in South Africa and globally have played a really important role in highlighting the issues that women have faced over time. And I mentioned that I feel we don't often give them enough credit and that, you know, historically women's magazines are considered lightweight journalism because they don't cover sort of breaking news, you know, or, or whatever newspapers do. But in fact, they played a very important role in terms of um, writing about the things that women have experienced. There is a story that touched me in the book uh, about Yvonne was killed by her husband um, who was employed by the Department of Correctional Services inside the main Senate court. How prevalent are these stories in South Africa? And tell us about the shocking sentence that uh, the husband received. In the book, uh, I mention one very well-known, very well-publicized case, which was written about extensively at the time of the murder, which was in the 1990s. Um, which was the killing of a, a woman, Yvonne Ramontuedi, whose uh, husband, she was estranged from her husband, was a prison warder, and she was trying to obtain maintenance for her child. And on the day that she went to maintenance court with a police escort to the court building because her husband had been threatening her, um, when she was briefly left alone in the court offices, it wasn't in a courtroom, it was in the court offices with uh, with her husband, he um, drew his service pistol, which he, or I don't know if it was a pistol, his service firearm, and he shot her and he killed her in the um, in the court building itself. This is obviously an extremely unusual case. Um, he was allowed to carry his firearm because he was a prison warder, and then he received a, a custodial sentence, which essentially allowed him to not be imprisoned, um, but to serve kind of, uh, not community service hours, but to serve his hours out over weekends while continuing to work later on as a prison warder and having his uh, firearm eventually returned to him as it was determined that it was necessary for his job. But this was an exceptional case. So there are not other examples of similar cases that are exactly like that. Um, but if you read the rest of the book, um, there are multiple cases across many decades of uh, men working in security industries, including in our police forces and in private security, um, who uh, have murdered their intimate partners. Um, so we are aware that men having having access to firearms is um, a high risk issue in terms of um, fatal violence against their intimate partner. Um, maybe also just a quick note on how we keep statistics is there is in fact several chapters in this book that explain why we don't keep very clear statistics on intimate partner killings. Um, we have many different agencies within the state, from the police to the justice system. We have civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations. Um, domestic violence, there's an act, there's a Domestic Violence Act, which offers protection to women. But when you go in and charge somebody with a crime of killing another person, the crime is murder. So there's not a special subsect of murder that's called domestic violence murders. As such... Um, it's often left to you know the media or the police to interpret what kind of a killing it was, if it was an intimate partner killing. And there again, the police understanding of what domestic violence is includes all violence in the home. So that's why you know statistically it is 
a challenge to know exactly what's happening. All we have to go on are the cases that get reported on that we can learn about. And that's why, you know, we have to often rely on media reports or um, information from courts sometimes. But um, the case of Yvonne Ramontwedi was, well, it was an exception in its circumstances. It certainly wasn't an exception in the killing. Um, information that has been published for quite a long time and is included in, for example, my previous book on femicide, um, we know that based on current figures, somewhere between eight and 11 women on average are murdered in South Africa every single day, and that more than half of these women are killed by a current or former intimate partner. The circumstances under which those women are killed vary dramatically. Um, most women are at risk in their own homes. Many, many, many women are killed in their own homes um, or in the home of the perpetrator. Um, women are killed in the street. They are killed at funerals. They are killed outside schools. There is no place where um, women are particularly safe. Women have been killed inside police stations by their police officer partners. Um, so we look to Yvonne Ramontwedi's case as an example of the failures of the justice system and how, for example, what should be an ordinary act for a, a parent, which is to ask for you know, maintenance payments for a child, how that should be a safer space for them, but how this became a vulnerable space for them. And I think what this book emphasizes, and my other books have shown the same, is that there are no real safe spaces for women. Even the spaces that should be safe are, are, are places where they are vulnerable. You also speak about what is known as the matter of installment, and you also share Augustine's story, who killed her husband in self-defense. Tell us what circumstances are looked at to come to such a conclusion in the case of a woman uh, killing her intimate partner in defense. All right. The idea for this book started with a discussion with Glynis Breitenbach, who's a former state prosecutor and a member of parliament. Um, and she was telling me about a legal precedent in South African statutes. Um, and she mentioned a concept called murder by installment. And this concept was, in fact, cited in a South African judgment where a woman had um, killed her abusive partner. Um, in self, well, it wasn't in self defense because he wasn't necessarily killing, he wasn't abusing her at the time that she killed him. And this is why it became a very interesting case and a very important concept. And the phrase murder by installment referred to an earlier case that had taken place in Canada, um, where a woman who had been living with an abusive partner, um, I'm going to forget the exact example details of the case, but um, had been abused by her partner for many years and at one point. Um, had shot him, but I think perhaps in his back when he had turned away from her. And so it was a challenging case because usually the defense of self-defense is you can uh, you can meet somebody with, with equal force, but only in the moment when you're being threatened. So if you kill somebody when they're not actually threatening you in that moment, creates a legal challenge is, you know, are you allowed to kill them in self-defense? When What are you defending? Um, and in the case of abused women, because of size differences and power differences, there are a number of you know prominent cases where women have waited, for example, until their partner was asleep um, or incapacitated their partner otherwise in order to kill him because it wasn't possible for them to kill him while he was awake because he was too much bigger or much faster. And in the Canadian case that was cited in the South African courtrooms, um, the judge there had acquitted the woman or, or found her not guilty and said that expecting an abused woman to wait to respond until her partner was physically threatening her life was tantamount to sentencing her to murder by installment. The second case that you mentioned now was a historical case that had happened in Paris um, a number of decades ago in the early 1900s at some point, where uh, which was reported in the South African newspapers. It was reported in the Rand Daily Mail um, and then I tracked it down and I read some of the original reporting in the Paris and French newspapers from the time. And that was where, again, a woman in, in Paris had shot and killed her abusive husband. 
but this was while he was in the process of actually a- attacking her. He was um, uh, trying to bash down her door. She had moved away from him. Her name was Augustine Talbo, and she had moved away from her abusive husband with her children. Uh, he was a notorious drunkard and, and very abusive to her. One night he'd come and found her at her new accommodation and tried to attack her. And she had shot and killed him with a revolver that she'd, I think, procured for self-defense. And the the reason why I, I mentioned this case was, was one of the, not the earliest, but it was one of the earlier sort of examples of uh, South African news reporting on a legal matter elsewhere in the world where a woman had shot and killed an abusive partner and had been acquitted by the jury. And in the case of Augustine Talbot, what had also happened was, in fact, the jury had felt so sorry for her after acquitting her that they'd also whipped around and um, raised money for her and contributed money to her out of their own pockets. But within that case, and I don't, I'm not going to search for it in my book now, but she had shot him, shot her husband, I think it was something like 16 times or 18 times. I can't remember exactly how many bullets landed. But in order to do that, given the firearm technology of the day, she would have had to, they didn't have semi-automatic weapons yet, so she would have had, you know, a revolver. Um, she would have had to reload a number of times. And again, in South African context, if you shot somebody, you know, if you used up your full rounds and then you reloaded and shot them again, it, it's often considered overkill in intimate partner matters. So it was just a, a historical example. But that predated by, you know, some 70 years or so, the use of the term in court, murder by installment. And what I try and explore in the sort of last quarter of the book really is what happens when women say no to that final installment. So most of the book deals with cases of women who were murdered by their intimate partners and in almost all of those cases there is evidence of a long or short history but definitely a history of abuse that preceded their murders and that shows what murder by installment looks like is that these women were exposed to violence and to threats and to control um, on a regular basis before their death and if those threats had been taken seriously perhaps the deaths could have been averted. And so the last section of the book looks at what happens when women say no, when they stop that final installment through their own violent means, um, through killing their abusive partners. Um, And what I look at in the book is how the South African legal understanding of self-defense and the rights of abused women to defend themselves have changed, not since the time of Augustine Talbert, because that wasn't a South African case and that was a very long time ago, but particularly since the 1990s, since our constitution was introduced, um, and since we've had updates to not only the Domestic Violence Act, but various other acts protecting the the rights of women. Is there a specific target that you are targeting uh, to read this book, or is just widely for women and uh, anyone in, in, in the country that could be interested in finding more about this subject? I am never really sure who wants to read these kinds of books. They're very depressing. Um, at the start of the interview, you know, you mentioned um, how I was at one point reluctant to even finish it because of the subject matter was extremely depressing. It doesn't make you feel very optimistic about the world or about relationships um, or about men and women. Um, mm-hmm. But I think what is really important for this is And we've seen since COVID that the number of women being killed has actually increased. And at some point, we need to ask ourselves why on paper our laws are improving and our systems in theory are improving to protect women. But in reality, what we're seeing is that we have more women dying now than Mm. five or 10 years ago. Um, And that speaks to some real serious underlying problems that we have not effectively resolved. Um, To that end, a lot of these kinds of cases, they don't come out of the blue. Most domestic violence killings don't start with, I mean, there's this idea that killings happen in the heat of the moment. And there are sort of, I mean, whether you want to call them crimes of passion or crimes of anger, there are obviously many crimes like that. But the majority of domestic violence cases where women are killed by their partners are um, systematic They have taken place over a really long period of time. And that means that there is something that we can actually do to prevent these deaths. But where we find ourselves is that 
women are still not believed. They're not believed by the system. They're not supported by the system. And by the system, I mean by the police services or by the justice system in South Africa. Um, there are still cases where women are not supported and believed by their community and family members. And I don't want to only place the burden on individuals to, to do better because the state also really needs to do better. But um, women especially when women have families, when they have children, if they complain that their partner is abusive, they're often sent back into that abusive environment because, uh, you know, they're told it's best for the children. And we really need to change this assumption that um, a family unit with a mom and a dad and two or three kids is um, is somehow better where the woman's being abused than, you know, than, than a different version. Um, we need to stop putting the health of the family, the imagined family, we need to stop putting the health of the imagined family ahead of the health and safety of that woman. Um, because time and time again, there are just stories that endlessly show that women are sent back into those environments at great risk to their own health and well-being. And we really need to, to stop doing that. A final important audience, I think, for this book is women who have been abused or who are in abusive situations I think it's very unlikely that a woman who is in a controlling situation is going to be able to read this book because controlling and coercive partners are so hypervigilant and, and they surveil everything that that partner does. But for any woman who's ever experienced abuse, I think it's important that we keep on telling these people that they didn't imagine it, that it was as bad as they thought. They need to stop gaslighting themselves um, because... I think often women experience abuse and then after it's ended, hopefully if it ends, they say, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. Uh, it was just, it was just a bit threatening. It wasn't serious. And what this book really shows is that things that seem not quite so serious to start off with can escalate quite rapidly. So women need to believe themselves. Um, other people need to believe women and our state our police and our, our courts need to really, truly support these women far better than they currently are. And so the target markets are not only women and communities, but also people who are making policies, people who work in policing services, who work in justice services. If they can start reading these books and connecting the stories in slightly different ways to maybe start thinking about where could we improve in the areas where we could actually help save lives. There was Nehama Brody discussing a book titled Domestic Terror, Intimate Partner Violence in South Africa.